So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue à Montréal. Welcome to Montreal. My name is Denis Chagnon, and I will be your master of ceremony for the next three days. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this Industry Engagement Day. Introduction to the second annual Global Aviation Security Symposium, and this year on the theme of the need to know. The format of today's event is designed to stimulate enhanced collaboration and two-way communications among industry, research and academic institutions, and member states. The aim is to advance aviation security in the areas of technology and innovation. On your behalf, let me thank the select group of key policy and decision makers that have graciously taken the time to join us for these roundtable discussions and interactive dialogue sessions. Let me also thank the speakers who will be delivering Sky Talks over the course of the day. The Sky Talk concept is an excellent opportunity to share best practices and practical solutions to the many challenges we all face in the aviation security domain. Also in support of practical and transferable experiences for you to bring back to your respective organizations, workshops on topical and sensitive issues will be held throughout the day. The subjects range from conflict zones to security sensitive issues. Please check your program for location and times for these workshops. If you want to take part, you must register as the number of seats is limited. You can do so through the symposium website under the workshops tab. Finally, I would invite you to visit the many sponsors and exhibitors who have joined us for the industry exhibition. Our industry partners very much look forward to exchanging with you on the latest technological developments and innovations, all designed to ensure a more secure and user-friendly travel experience. Before we get underway, I do have a few housekeeping items. I would kindly ask that you turn or place on silent mode your telephones and other electronic equipment so that we do not distract from our presentations and exchanges. I would also ask that you return promptly to the assembly hall following coffee and lunch breaks so that we can give all of our attention to the speakers and provide their allotted time. In the spirit of making this event even more interactive for everyone, we have once again made available an app for this engagement day and symposium. The name of the app is AVSEC 2018, and you can download it via your own app store or both Android and iPhone devices. Alternatively, you can go directly to the website, as you see on the screen, and for both the app and the website, log in with hashtag AVSEC2018. With the app, you can stay connected at all times, ask questions during panel sessions, and respond to polling opportunities. And you do have all of the details in your program, the first page of your program. should make it easier for you to download the app and use it throughout Engagement Day and the symposium. And again this year, we have simultaneous interpretation in the six official languages of ICAO. The earphones and instructions on selecting the language of your choice is on the table in front of you. And now, it is my privilege to introduce our guest speakers who will provide the backdrop for expanded collaboration and synergy between states and industry in the pursuit of optimum aviation security. We begin with Mr. Sylvain Lefoyer, Deputy Director, Aviation Security and Facilitation at ICAO, for his opening remarks. Sylvain? Monsieur. Merci, Denis. Thank you, Denis. Good morning to everybody. I'm going to be speaking French, so you can uh, try out the interpretation equipment. 
And uh, greetings to the interpreters who are with us this week. Uh, it's our pleasure to be with you. So welcome to Montreal, all of you. I am not going to repeat what Denis said. You're aware of uh, what is going to happen uh, throughout the day in our program. Let me just tell you why we wanted to have uh, this engagement day so that we could uh, have discussions and engage with industry. There are a lot of events, symposia, uh, for uh, conferences on aviation security. And uh, why do we need another one? Because ICAO is the place where states come together to make decisions about uh, orientations and regulations that will uh, then be implemented in the countries that will become uh, regulations, technical specifications and requirements. And uh, all this helps us uh, implement uh, security measures by equipment and uh, make sure that aviation security is uh, at the requisite level. So it's very important for us to have these discussions here with you so that we can get feedback and uh, information from equipment manufacturers, uh, operators, airports, uh, states, so as to uh, inform the regulatory process which uh, will lead to SARPs and uh, which uh, states will implement uh, in the form of laws and decrees and technical specifications. It's, it's important to have talks here because that enables you to exchange views and experiences and you can tell us about your needs and expectations and uh, that will help uh, the decision makers from the states in uh, their regulatory process. So it's very important for us to bring together in the same room all of the people who are part of uh, aviation security so that we can move forward together defining uh, SARPs uh, without uh, taking account of the needs of uh, manufacturers, airports, airlines uh, would be a futile effort. That's why we in wanted, in addition to the second symposium, that's why we wanted to have this second uh, event, this engagement day with industry so that we can move forward together. I'm going to be very brief because uh, we're a bit behind schedule. The important thing is uh, for me to listen to you and not the other way around. So we're going to start uh, hearing from two people who are going to be able to give you an interesting perspective. First, the point of view of uh, a state that uh, has uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, structure uh, for regulations, uh, defining uh, procedural norms, uh, in equipment implementation, uh, namely the TSA. So they have a vertical structure that uh, makes it possible to establish the link between operations policies and technical innovation. And that is why we uh, asked uh, for them to come and speak to us and give us their unique perspective. So that's uh, the TSA. And then we have IKEA. I can't even pronounce it in French, but uh, I think uh, they'll be telling us uh, more about uh, their organization. They represent uh, industry associations, equipment manufacturers, uh, aircraft manufacturers, and uh, security equipment manufacturers. And these perspectives will set the tone for the day. And we'll have four sessions, so we'll be talking about uh, the present, the future, how to um, uh, consider screening and uh, reframe screening, and we'll think out of the box and uh, challenge our traditional way of seeing things and doing things. So I've said too much already. I'd just like to thank all of you for coming all the way to Montreal. We've uh, turned the heat up. Uh, last week it was uh, minus 17, but uh, the weather's a bit more mild this week, so we're doing what we can. Bear with us. And I hope that this day and next days will uh, provide an opportunity for fruitful discussions that will enhance our mutual knowledge and effectively and constructively inform our work that we do together. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, Sylvain. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Indeed, it is uh, a lot warmer uh, and milder this week. I'd like to correct something I mentioned just a few moments ago. When you download the app, uh, the name would be ICAO Event. ICAO Event is the name of the app. I apologize for that slight mistake. And when you register for an event, you have, of course, to choose the event. We now move on to the views of the regulator in this issue. And to do that, we have Mr. Keith Gall, Deputy Assistant Administrator, Security Technology at the Transportation Security Administration of the United States. Mr. Gall has been with the TSA from its inception. He currently leads efforts to grow capability analysis, expertise, centralize requirements for the agency, and demonstrate emerging technologies through TSA's Innovation Task Force and Air Cargo and Service Technology test beds. He also guides the activities for development of future technologies, a current focus being advancing computed technology, technology capabilities to meet the demands of the evolving threats against transportation security. In addition, Mr. Gall is co-chairman of the Aviation Security Advisory Committee Security Technology Subcommittee and has led past efforts for development of TSA's five-year technology investment plan. So, Mr. Gall, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. There we go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Dennis, for the introduction, and thank you, Sylvain, for the opening remarks. I was able to navigate the uh, interpretation device, so I was able to actually hear them. Um, I'd like to acknowledge others in attendance today, uh, including ICAO, my fellow presenters, uh, my international industry counterparts, and partners, and all attendees. Aviation security, specifically aviation security technology, has been my life's work, so I'm gratified to be asked by ICAO to participate today. I'm here to give the regulators perspective, as well as discuss the United States priorities for advancing aviation security in the area of technology and innovation. This idea of the culture of innovation may seem, uh, may seem at odds with the topic of a regulator's perspective to which I've been asked to speak. When the word regulations come to mind, often industry and the public think of hindrances and measures that slow development. However, as Sylvain mentioned, the reality of TSA's role is that we function as both the regulator and the operator of aviation security. So the nature of our work is to find a balance in achieving the intended benefits and security of regulatory measures without sacrificing the progress that comes through innovation. I'd like to thank ICAO again for organizing this important event. ICAO's leadership is critical to ensure the global aviation community is prepared to respond to the challenges of our dynamic, no-fail operating environment and our ever-evolving adversaries. ICAO has a powerful voice in guiding its member states and encouraging aviation stakeholders to not only meet current baseline, but raise the global baseline for aviation security. Global threat response warrants partnership, information sharing, and collaboration. ICAO has been instrumental to key global initiatives, such as the UN Security Council resolution supporting aviation security effectiveness and sustainability, and robust international involvement in the development and endorsement of the Global Aviation Security Plan. The United States and TSC, TSA agree with the stated goals in the GASIP of the pursuit of increased innovation and the development of aviation security technologies. These tools I mentioned above help create a secure global aviation network and increase our collective speed to action. I'm looking forward to the four sessions that are on the program for today, and I'd like to share a few thoughts on th thoughts and items I'm excited about for each session. Each of the sessions have a strong relationship to achieving the goals of the GASIP. The first session, being moderated by my colleague Nick Biancini, will focus on how we 
can work to increase the speed for identifying, testing, and deploying effective solutions to, a, to address the threats we are seeing today. The threat to aviation remains constant, with our adversaries steadfast in their determination to find flaws in our systems. Agile adversaries demand agile solutions. We must work together to develop security solutions that support growth without sacrificing time to field these solutions. Governments must do all that they can to improve the process for testing and certifying technology and other solutions necessary to fill the identified capability gaps. The aviation security industry is important in helping us achieve this speed, working hand in hand with governments. This is especially true when we take a system of systems approach where the U.S. and other governments set those standards and industry decides how to best achieve the results. The international community can help make achieving these results easier by working to align on common requirements and to increase the utilization of information sharing mechanisms. ICAO-sponsored information sharing solutions, fully supported by member states, will enable the global aviation security community to accelerate action in response to the changing threat environment. The second session then shifts focus to the solutions of tomorrow, particularly to emerging screening technologies and other solutions. Our adversaries are investing in and making progress from research and development initiatives which we must match and surpass if we are to continue achieving success in this no-fail environment. TSA specifically has made strides to improve the speed to which it responds to the, the, to the dynamic threat that exists. Uh, TSA has recently established an innovation task force that allows TSA to demonstrate and evaluate emerging capabilities in an operational environment in a more expeditious manner. By leveraging public-private partnerships, this has allowed TSA to demonstrate improved technology solutions to include cabin baggage and passenger screening technologies, introduction of biometric solutions at the checkpoints, and improved alarm resolution techniques. In addition, the United States Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate has established a research and development program called Screening at Speed to identify technology solutions that will increase security effectiveness while also improving the passenger experience. And this is a hard challenge, making that balance. Not all problems have a technology-based high monetary solution. Process innovation, for example, human performance work, can improve security outcomes just by changing the way security workforce conducts their jobs and how they are trained. In other words, work smarter, not harder. All these changes are made possible by TSA's willingness to adjust regulations to allow for the changes of processes and technology that are needed to keep aircraft, pilots, workers, and travelers safe. Change and innovation can only thrive under the cooperation of international agencies, organizations, and the industry partners that support them. I encourage us to maximize the use of the AVSEC panel working groups to leverage member states' innovations and information system-wide changes. In the afternoon, we will have discussions about how we can change the way we operate and deploy at the checkpoint to relieve the pressures that the system is under. The breadth of our responsibilities at the checkpoint only increase every year. The number of annual, annual airplane passengers is expected to double to just under eight billion per year by the year 2036. Growing volume coupled with increasing threat presents a unique challenge as we think through checkpoint solutions. We must balance the need to continually increase security effectiveness with the need to deliver a high quality passenger experience for all industry customers. Checkpoint solutions will take many different forms, from technological solutions, such as automated 
screening solutions, or deep learning algorithms, to adaptations of checkpoint setup, operations, and resolution processes that all work to better mitigate threats and increase throughput. TSA has most recently sought to improve checkpoint outcomes with our Future Lane Experience Program, also known as FLEX, that will, explain, that will expand how we route passengers by risk. We will be piloting these changes over the next year and will share the outcomes of, this, of these solutions. Transparency of innovation initiatives and robust information sharing allows member states to learn from each other's expertise, work towards shared goals, and shorten decision life cycles. The United States has benefited from this type of information technical exchange. The U.S. work on a, a, anomalous behavior detection, automated screening lanes, computed tomography, and remote alarm resolution has been informed by other member states' research, testing, and best practices. The final session today will bring even more of an industry perspective on how digital solutions can be integrated into the technology experience of today and the future. As we enter the increasing digital age, it is of paramount importance that we utilize the gains we are experiencing in digital technology to improve our business and aviation security technology to drive effectiveness in operations, cost, and general effectiveness of the solutions we have in the field. From the TSA perspective, we have published our biometrics roadmap, which lays out how we were trying to take advantage of advancements in digital transformation to improve both security effectiveness and passenger experience. In addition, the TSA Chief Information Officer has also started engaging with international partners to focus on establishing common requirements regarding, regarding cybersecurity. This is of paramount importance as we embark on this digital transformation. I'm excited to hear about all the technologies that are being developed in and with the aviation security industry to provide these improvements. As I've said before, and I'm saying again, the cooperation between all of the industry partners we engage with is of vital importance to making sure we are able to do our jobs to the best of our capability and potential. So in conclusion, we need your help as industry as much as any time in our history to work with us to combat these changing threats. I appreciate everyone's participation today and look forward to the discussions about how all of us can set the standards necessary to create effective solutions for combating these threats while still allowing industry to develop and deploy innovative technologies and processes at airports across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith, for having provided the very valuable perspective from the regulator. And now we turn to the industry's perspective, and this will be addressed by Mr. Cameron Mann. He is Global Market Director, Aviation at Smith's Detection Group, and he's also a member of the International Coordinating Council of Aerospace Industries Associations. In his current position at Smith's, Mr. Man is responsible for strategy development and implementation of the aviation market. He previously held management appointments in Asia Pacific, based in Sydney as the regional managing director and head of mature markets for Asia Pacific. Prior to that, he was managing director of Australia and New Zealand and director of product management for the integrated systems product lines. From 2003 to 2011, Mr. Cameron was based in Singapore, serving in various sales and management roles, leading market-based teams across Asia. So again, Mr. Mann's presentation will focus on the industry, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, everyone. I work uh, as uh, 
was mentioned for Smith's detection, but today I'm here representing industry, um, and Smith's is uh, present on a number of industry bodies and associations. Um, I'd like to thank Sylvan and Keith um, for the opportunity to join them today here on, uh, at the podium. Um, and then also I'd like to thank um, the audience here today for participating in the industry engagement event. And then for those who are joining the discussion online, welcome. I think one of the things that Keith mentioned in his, uh, in his opening remarks there was um, looking at trying to accelerate innovation, which is a key objective um, from, an from an industry perspective. Um, I, th I see it as a common goal, um, but embracing innovation needs to be an organisational wide activity, um, not just the idea of a few. Um, today I'd like to really address six things um, from an industry perspective. The first is enabling risk-based security. The second is building trust between regulators and industry. The third is about harmonising standards. The fourth is how we expedite uh, standard setting in the approval process. The fifth is how we accelerate innovation to market. And then finally, some comments on cyber security. The aviation ecosystem is comprised of airports, airlines, regulators, controlling authorities, and agencies, including industry partners and representative bodies. We often have competing priorities, but what everyone is aligned on is to ensure that air travel remains safe and secure. Threats continue to persist um, in three significant areas, insider threats, complex concealment of explosive devices, and the move of the attack vector to, air, oh, sorry, to land side. The aviation network has seen challenges from all three of these areas in the last few years. So why do incidents still occur? This is because the adversary is smart and the threat's evolving. Our principal challenge is to keep ahead of these two elements while managing to keep the aviation network functional. As all stakeholders in our ecosystem look to balance operational efficiency, improve the passenger experience while assuring a secure outcome. As part of today's address, I wanted to share some perspectives from industry on how to ensure that we continue to maintain a safe and secure aviation network. Our, our ecosystem cannot stand still. There are pressures which are challenging air travel from the evolving threats to passenger volume outstripping supply, and then the impact of disruptive technologies to support innovative solutions and changes to operating models throughout the value chain. So how do we achieve the pace and the change required? Firstly, we need to embrace risk-based security. In August last year, Amendment 15 of Annex 17 um, recommended the implementation of innovative processes and procedures to allow operational differentiation of screening and security controls. This is a risk-based approach. Industry supports the approach as it allows differentiated screening, adapting to the individual, making screening personalised, depending on the individual's risk profile. This allows the network to flex and adapt to changing threats to ensure targeted measures can be employed above the baseline to those representing the greatest risk. Risk-based security brings in other technologies other than security scanners incorporating biometrics, analytics, and artificial intelligence into the risk-based security framework for greater differentiation. Secondly, we need to build greater trust between the regulator or regulators and industry. This would ensure, sec this would ensure technology roadmaps um, remain in line with emerging threats and positions industry to respond faster to change. As part of this trust is to ensure that industry understands the threat well enough so new and existing technologies can be deployed against specific threats. Sharing ensures that time to deployment of, mature, of a mature capability is reduced, closing any network vulnerabilities. Thirdly is the need to harmonise standards. 
There needs to be more global cooperation and mutual recognition of certifications. This reduces the overhead associated with getting technologies into the field, which gives more companies greater opportunities to participate in the solution. And fourthly, is about expediting standard setting and the approval process. In order to be responsive in time sensitive environments, many evaluation processes currently take over two years, which is not appropriate to operational security emergencies. So in order to change this, there should be fast track options with enough capacity at national testing centres as well as introducing qualified commercial testing entities to meet the evaluation demand. Fifthly, we need to look at accelerating innovation to market. Funding needs to um, be there to address multiple levels and time frames, from academic and fundamental research to address the longer term window, um, to looking at innovation funding streams for largely smaller companies with new ideas to accelerate their TRL level maturity. Some examples of this are the future aviation security solutions or FAS in the UK and then also the Innovation Demonstration for Enterprise Advancement or IDEA which is part of the um, Innovation Task Force in the TSA. But more can be done. And finally, funding needs to be available to industrialise these capabilities so that commercial airports can adopt real solutions without introducing risk in the process. This also means supporting um, and funding trials and rapid prototyping as part of the development of the solution. One area to be conscious of here is that if industry is asked to develop a response to a threat and largely self-fund it, the right regulatory environment must be established. The industry response to lags was significant, but the regulatory environment was not clear, with aviation stakeholders lobbying for different outcomes. The result was capabilities developed, but largely not deployed. This outcome makes industry cautious in future when there is a new threat without, a regulatory, without the regulatory assurance. This slows the development and the deployment, which is not a desirable outcome for any stakeholder. And powders is an interesting case in point. In June this year, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the US all placed restrictions on the carriage of powders in the cabin. In a similar way, lags restrictions were introduced. If the desire of regulators is to introduce technical measures to address the threat, there needs to be given some thought about how industry can participate in the solution while creating the right regulatory environment to accelerate the solution development and deployment. And lastly, cyber security. Devices and networks are increasingly vulnerable in the connected world. We need to ensure that global standards for compliance um, are available and in place so that industry only needs to address one set of standards to avoid costly duplication and complexity while effectively closing the gap. ICAO Annex 17 framework largely tries to address the dynamic nature of our industry. There's been 16 amendments since its inception, but change is often slower than many would like. Our collective challenge is the pace of implementation which tests the aviation network in the face of an evolving threat. As all stakeholders try, strive for cooperation and operational efficiency to improve the passenger experience, all the while maintaining the security effectiveness, there are sometimes competing priorities. These need to be understood but also overcome if we're going to maintain a safe and secure aviation network. I hope you enjoy the industry engagement today and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mann, and thank you to both speakers for having provided under the umbrella of ICAO's presentation this morning, the synergy, the collaboration that we have to maintain and develop over the years in reacting and being ahead of the many challenges that we face in aviation security. 
In just a few moments, we will move on to our first official session of the morning. I would invite the members of the first group to remain here for just a second and then we'll take the family portrait and at the same time in the wings the members of the first panel if you could slowly make your way up to the stage again let's have a very warm round of applause for our speakers this morning thank you gentlemen Okay, so we're all set up. As I mentioned a few moments ago, and through our speakers as well, states and industry stakeholders face a number of challenges in their efforts to develop, adapt, and deploy effective and efficient screening technologies to combat evolving security threats to aviation. This is the theme of our first session of the day, and it will be moderated by Dominique Bianchini. Dominique is Senior Technical Advisor with the Transportation Security Administration in the United States and Co-Rapporteur of the ICAO AFSEC Panel Working Group on Innovation in Aviation Security. As Senior Technical Advisor, he is responsible for reviewing and responding to classified information inquiries relating to aviation screening capabilities, system vulnerabilities, and providing technical briefings to TSA leadership, congressional staffers, foreign delegations, and aviation industry representatives. He is also responsible for working with international partners in the alignment of technical detective standards and common testing methodologies. As the co-chair of the ICAO Working Group on Innovation in Aviation Security, and TSA Technical Representative on the European Civil Aviation Conference Technical Task Force. He collaborates with foreign government organizations to enhance global aviation security performance. So Dominique, we're very much looking forward to your presentations this morning. Good morning. So, uh, first off, thank you very much to our colleagues in ICAO for organizing today's Industry Day. Uh, so we're very excited to be part of that. Um, 
for the topic of the discussion, we hope that everyone will find it to be both relevant and timely. Uh, it addresses a very important question that I think it's been asked a number of times over the years. Some folks have claimed that maybe it's too aspirational and that it's a, it's a stretch to ultimately get there. Others have claimed that it's something that should have happened many years ago. And the fundamental question comes down to, is it possible for a KO to establish a minimum global performance-based requirements that would potentially expedite the acceptance, installation, operational use, and recertification of enhanced security equipment? Each year, airports around the world are challenged to make very important investment decisions around the investment in aviation screening technology. These investments require a lot of time, energy, and resources. And the goal is to invest in technologies that supports the needs of the users and the operators. There are a number of options that airports can take today. They can reach uh, and contact uh, various manufacturers. Uh, they can uh, determine and understand the various product lines that are available. They can work with other airport operators that may or may not have tested new technologies, new concepts. They can reach out to our colleagues in the various associations to obtain lessons learned and best practices. They can go to the European Civil Aviation Conference website and review the list of technologies that have been tested by ECAC. So there are a number of steps that can be taken. But the question becomes, can we do more? Can we work with our colleagues in ICAO to develop minimum performance requirements around specific technologies to help ICAO members make informed decisions. So today we're joined by uh, a diverse group of panelists with many years of experience. We have representatives from the regulators and the test community. We have representatives from the user community, as well as industry and associations as well. And these are the questions that we're going to be looking at today. Understanding the methods and the process and the procedures that are being used today to certify and approve technologies, can that be leveraged and implemented through ICAO? So, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce my first panelist, uh, Mr. Andy Lee. He is uh, currently the Director of Test and Evaluation Division within the Office of Acquisition Program and Management uh, in the Transportation Security Administration. Uh, in his role, he leads the development and operational testing of technologies and capabilities for TSA. And Andy is also the director of the TSA System Integration Facility, uh, which serves the director, and he serves as the director of the Department of Homeland Security as the designated independent operational test agent. And Andy has over 27 years of experience in both the Federal Aviation Administration and the Transportation Security Administration. So Andy, we know today that TSA performs uh, certification and qualification testing. And I think in some people's minds, there's some mystery around what is certification versus qualification. Um, and I think as Keith highlighted earlier, uh, at least in TSA's role, we're responsible for establishing the standards, conducting the testing, and then ultimately using the technology uh, across airports, uh, or airports across the United States. So if you wouldn't mind providing a, a brief overview on that, and I believe we do have a slide for Andy to help uh, convey this very important topic. Yes, thank you, Nick. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be here to be on this panel to, uh, to discuss this, this, what I think is a very important topic uh, to all of us. So yes, feeding off of what, what Nick said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the United States um, testing process for certifying and qualifying technologies. Um, and f to us, those are two very distinct terms, certification and qualification. For the purposes of the question we are addressing here, I think the focus is on that pure certification, but I wanted to start out by kind of explaining the differences um, to us within the TSA. So certification has been around for many, many years, even before TSA existed. Certification to us refers specifically to detection performance of a security screening technology. And so in order for TSA to procure any security screening equipment, it must first be certified. It must first meet our detection standards and be able to detect the things that we need it to detect. 
And that starts with the very specific detailed detection standards that Nick is, and his group um, develop and work on on a day-to-day -day basis. And that testing is then executed by the Transportation Security Laboratory, which is a DHS science and technology laboratory in New Jersey. But that's just the first piece to our testing process. Because the TSA is not only a regulator but also the operator, we have many additional requirements that we place on any security screening equipment. So after a technology is certified and we know that it can detect what we need it to detect, we then put it through the paces to make sure it can also meet the other requirements that TSA is interested in. Those requirements such as suitability, reliability, maintainability, safety, human uh, interface performance, interoperability, and obviously cybersecurity. That testing is then carried out at the TSA Systems Integration Facility um, in Washington, D.C. And so once a technology is certified and makes it through the laboratory in D.C. for that qualification testing, then we do the formal operational testing in the field to make sure that whatever technology that we are considering will actually fit into our very intricate operational environment. Once that is done, then the system is deemed to be qualified, which is above and beyond that pure certification detail. But for the purposes of this panel, I do want to focus on that certification, kind of the process that we use. Um, again, that certification is carried out by the laboratory in New Jersey, the Transportation Security Lab, based off of the specific detection standards that Nick and his team develop. We develop those detection standards, share them with industry, and then industry is invited to come into the laboratory and do any data collection that they need, do any preparatory work, development work, in cooperation with the TSL. And they go through a series of what we call readiness tests. I like to refer to this as kind of a, a, a semester in college. So the vendors receive the detection standard. They know the requirements. So that's kind of your, kind of your, your syllabus and your schedule for the semester. They go through the data collection and they go through the readiness tests, which are kind of a series of tests along the way. So if you think of you know, your quizzes and your, your midterm exams, the readiness test just tries to gauge how the technology is doing as they're trying to meet that ultimate detection standard. And then the formal certification test at the end is kind of the final exam. And once you pass that final exam, then you're deemed to be certified by TSA. And so that's where I think that certification um, and we've been working very closely with, with, with ECAC to try to harmonize not only those detection standards, but also how we do the testing, the testing methodology, and getting into those very detailed specifics of the test execution to try to find ways that we can harmonize um, and come together universally. And I think that's what, where there's a great opportunity to expand on um, even more in, in a global nature. Thank you, Andy, for that. Um, so I'd like to move to our, our next panelist, uh, Ms. Sonia Hefty. Um, she wears many hats, as some of you may know, but today she is rep representing the European Civil Aviation Conference. Uh, she's a member of the Security Program Management Group. Uh, Sonia has many years of experience in working in aviation security uh, as a tester herself, working for STAC with the French government. Uh, she's a representative of the Director General of Civil Aviation for France. Uh, she's also a subject matter expert for France on the AFSEC panel, and she is my co rapporteur on the working group on innovation in aviation security. So yes, yeah, Sonia wears many hats. So, so Sonia, Andy highlighted ECAC um, and the process and methodologies they use today. 
We know that there's a technical task force and associated study groups all working to complete similar work in defining requirements, uh, developing testing methodologies. Would you mind uh, expanding or providing some insight on ECAC's approach? And then in, 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 your, in your discussion, maybe there may be options or opportunities to leverage some of that with an ICAO uh, mindset. Merci, Nick. Thank you, Nick. I'm going to speak French, so I'll let my co-panelists uh, put on their earpieces if they need them. In Europe, the situation is uh, very different. The organization is radically different from uh, what we've just seen uh, for North America and TSA. In Europe, the states and the EU uh, set down technical specifications, so what needs to be detected, what kind of uh, material has to be detected and uh, the introduction method. ECAC, through in its different working groups and the technical team, the technical task force and uh, in the working groups is going to define testing methodology. So there is a step prior to the test, and that is to determine how we are we going to test things, so what will the configurations be, how will I uh, how will the threat be introduced? Uh, how will it get through? It's all very detailed. And Andy referred to this. And uh, it's uh, the responsibility of uh, the European uh, Civil Aviation Conference, ECAC. So they organize uh, tests uh, at the different European testing centers. And they try to uh, organize the exchange of information uh, among the states. and also with the manufacturers. The states remain in charge of certification. That is a major difference uh, from what we heard this morning. Each uh, European state, each ECAC member state, uh, remains in charge of uh, equipment certification. And I'm going to speak broadly because each uh, step is governed differently, but the airports are often in charge of uh, equipment purchase, and they might also add their own uh, specifications, mainly operational specifications, and that's like uh, the qualification phase for the TSA. So the common evaluation program has been around for 10 years. Ten years ago, a number of states and competent authorities saw a need to get organized uh, for the testing. And uh, the arguments were exactly the same as the ones I heard this morning in the opening session, in particular the reasons given by uh, Mr. Mann noting that uh, it takes over two years between the time the equipment becomes available and the time that it can be installed at an airport. But there are many other problems as well. And uh, we're experiencing them at global level. And this also has to do with the fact that uh, equipment might uh, successfully pass a test in one state but be refused in another state. or. There might be 30 different configurations for the same piece of equipment deployed uh, in our airports. And uh, the passengers will be uh, flying on the same kind of planes. So often we have uh, trouble managing configuration. There's a problem of uh, trust uh, among states and among airports. And this prompted the European Union and ECAC to offer help to authorities that uh, create tests and avoid creating a completely new structure that would uh, change completely everything, but rather build on what we have. And this uh, allows authorities that do not have a testing platform to benefit uh, from uh, all of the uh, same information that uh, authorities are producing uh, as they conduct the testing. And so uh, decisions can be made. So this might be a first step to uh, global regulations, but It's hard to uh, achieve convergence in testing. The thing you have to understand when it comes to states is uh, that when we share uh, testing results, we share them with, uh, uh, it's not just the results about what the equipment can do, but also about what it cannot do. So the greatest vulnerability that uh, we can have is uh, 
sharing uh, information effectively, and we have to uh, make sure that we uh, get into uh, detail not just about technical specifications but also uh, methodologies. We have to tell about how the test is actually conducted on the ground, and uh, we have to talk about configurations with the equipment manufacturers. But uh, after 10 years, we're still having certain problems within ECAC. We're victims of our own success. A lot of tests are being requested that are extremely important uh, by uh, equipment manufacturers, and uh, it's uh, not possible for us to do all of them. And uh, a lot of times we have uh, very large equipment, and uh, that uh, makes things complicated. And today we're trying to find the best way to reduce the time needed. When the equipment is validated, uh, we need to know how it's uh, going to be modified. And in a global system, you have to start at the, uh, when the creation, when the equipment is created at the very beginning and not wait five years. Another important question that came up was whether these specifications uh, reach ICAO. And uh, a word of warning, the uh, sharing of information that's highly classified has to be uh, protected by existing regulations. We have to make sure that uh, the classified information is effectively protected. So before we achieve harmonization, uh, we have to uh, cover uh, exchange of information effectively. So this goes back to what I was saying about vulnerability. This means that uh, everybody here is uh, aware of uh, the threats, uh, the global threats. There shouldn't be a regional uh, specialities. I'm putting on my French hat here. And I would say that uh, this really is something we need to keep in mind. We need to keep our eye on uh, the threats uh, for each uh, set of equipment. We have to. Uh, make sure that the equipment is uh, comprehensive at the global level and it covers all the threats for everyone. Um, but that's uh, not an easy question to answer. I would say that there have been real improvements, uh, but there could be further improvements to information sharing that would reduce the time period uh, for powders and liquids, for example. We should... Uh, take care not to wait until we get global specifications to address the problems that are arising today. So it's important to have uh, goals, but uh, we shouldn't suspend everything uh, to uh, exchange information. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sonia, for that. That's very informative. Um, before we next to move to our next panelist, I would just highlight yet again, uh, there are polling questions that are available on the ICAO app. So if you have uh, the app, I'd recommend you might want to consider voting. It has a direct relevance to the discussion today, as well as, as the audience, you have the option to submit questions as well. Um, time allow allowing, we will uh, add those questions to, the, to our panelists, but understand we're, we're under time constraints, so we'll do the best we can. So with that, uh, our next panelist, Carlos Groot Tanner. Uh, he is the Director General for Global Express Association, which he joined in 2010. Uh, GEA represents three leading express delivery carriers, DHL Express, FedEx Express slash TNT, and UPS. Mr. Grell deals with international policy issues in the areas of trade, trade facilitation, customs, post and civil aviation, including air cargo security. I think at a high level, um, we obviously feel that equally important to passenger and baggage screening is the efficient and effective screening of air cargo. And we know air cargo comes in many diverse forms, uh, whether it be brake bulk or palletize, which can present its own challenges. So Carlos, if you wouldn't mind providing some input or insight on maybe the opportunity. In fact, KO pursues a global aviation standard. What would that mean for, for the cargo industry? Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning with you. Um, I'm from the express delivery industry. One would think that after Black Friday, we don't need an introduction. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, to explain where we're coming from, I'll try to explain in a few words what our business model is. Uh, and deep down, what we do is carry things 
from one doorstep on the planet to another doorstep on the planet very, very quickly. So speed is the essence of this business model. Now we do so globally. We, our members are present in 220 countries and territories. One of them boasts the fact that they are present in every country bar one, but I won't tell you which one that is. Um, and we are faced with uh, specific problems when it comes to making sure that cargo, the cargo is secured. We carry virtually any kind of commodity. So it could be a contract that you want signed the next morning and is very important to you. It could be your replacement passport because you lost it. Uh, it could be a spare part that you need for a factory uh, and if it doesn't get there on time, the factory stops with tremendous economic consequences. It could be cut flowers or fresh fish or a Formula One car. Some of these commodities are very difficult to screen. And so uh, we're constantly looking for technology that will have a high throughput and be able to screen different containers containing many different types of commodities. Now, the problem we face is, is double. On the one hand, much of the, the equipment we use is basically designed with a passenger environment in mind. So it's designed to screen, hold a baggage. And that is, I wouldn't say standard, but you know, uh, bags are very similar to each other. They are made up of a few materials and they tend to contain roughly the same commodities take add, but uh, it's very, very different, a much narrowed down version from the cargo world. Uh, secondly, there are many differing standards for the equipment. And again, uh, we operate in 220 countries and territories. You will approach us because you want something shipped to the other end of the planet in a maximum of 72 hours, sometimes even less than that. So we want our um, networks to be secure and we want to uh, cooperate with the authorities to have this trust that the network is indeed secured. Now when you face uh, these two challenges, that can be a problem. So would a, an ICAO basic, I'll say an ICAO basic certification uh, process add value? We think it would, with a few caveats. Now if we had it, uh, and when we do, uh, I think it would help with the availability of equipment. Uh, it would establish a common baseline for, for performance that would tell you what the equipment can, and as Sonia rightly pointed out, cannot do, but everyone would understand that. Um, it would be a lot easier to update software uh, for, for that kind of equipment if, if it is a basic, uh, a basic standard. Mm -hmm. It would also be easier to train people to that standard and uh, it would allow maybe things like remote control, remote uh, uh, screening because the machines operate to the same standard regardless of the location. Now, that doesn't mean it would be the same standard everywhere. That would be a basic standard in our, in our point of view. Uh, it, it would be a good start, but we see this as kind of concentric circles. Of course, we would expect countries to add requirements and specifications to that. But nevertheless, especially for those countries who, as Sonia pointed out, lack the capability to test, uh, this common standard would, we think, provide value. Um, this, however, has a few caveats. Uh, again, speed of the certification process would be important, as some of the previous speakers have pointed out. And uh, by all means, we don't want to be in a situation where this is instead of what is already done by the TSA, by ECAC, and by others. It would have to build on that experience. And uh, we would also want to avoid a situation where the better or the perfect is the enemy of the good. It has to be a good standard, and it has to be certified quickly. Now, let me finish with a, a couple of additional thoughts beyond just the realm of screening, uh, which is what previous speakers this morning have mentioned, a risk-based approach. Uh, now, six years ago in this room, we had the first high-level conference, and it endorsed a risk-based, outcomes-focused approach to 
aviation security, including cargo security. Uh, yes, there have been some steps in that direction, but some feel that there have also been steps in the opposite direction, that whenever there is an incident, you know, it feels good to go back to 100% screening. Whereas I think we should look at intelligence sharing as an important element that adds to better screening capacity because we have to focus the resources on the cargo that really can pose a threat. And for that, from an industry point of view, particularly from an industry that operates around the world and for which speed is the essence, sharing actionable intelligence is essential. So if uh, an authority thinks there is a particular threat, what we need to know is what to look for. And then we can use that technology to look for specifically that. And with that, uh, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Carlos. That's excellent. And I think you brought up some excellent points about intelligence sharing and, and obviously building on the experiences from, from the other certifying authorities. So that's, those are great points. Um, moving forward, um, we have a representative from the airport community, Mr. Lee Wamming. He is the general manager of the Beijing Capital Airport Aviation Security Company, which was formally established on October 10, 2006, as a professional company affiliated with the Capital Aerodrome Group and is the only one in the first domestic aviation security corporation with independent corporate qualifications up to now. Mr. Wamming, um, obviously airports are challenged with these type of investment questions. They want to know what to buy, when to buy. Hopefully they're buying solutions that meet their needs today, but also could meet our needs tomorrow. Do you have any thoughts or ideas on if ICAO pursues this approach for a global aviation standard, what would that mean for the airports? Thank you. Good morning to all. First of all, I would like to start from the aviation security perspective. Uh, for the time being, terrorism has stepped up and uh, launched a lot of uh, attacks. Therefore, anti-terrorism is a first priority from airport operation. Total passengers are increasing. However, security screening has not been more effective and uh, passengers have a lot of co complaints. Therefore, security checks encounter the security and uh, effectiveness and efficiency. These are our, this is our challenge. And equipage cannot keep pace with the demanding and facility requirements of passengers. The security equipments now in use can only detect the shapes of uh, the bags and uh, the capability is low. We need the operators, they need uh, training and knowledge to make sure if the bags are secure, we need human intervening. And therefore, the current status is not efficient enough. First, I have a few comments. First of all, ICO needs to establish requirements to motivate the industry to have innovations to improve capabilities. We should say we have emerging technologies and new algorithms we, which we can use so that the screening technologies can directly tell the articles if they are secure. Therefore, this can reduce the risk of human errors. And while improving security, it increases efficiency. For example, the CT equipment is a good one for cabin baggage. Secondly, the implementation of uh, aviation requirements can promote the implementation of operators. They can motivate them to use new technologies to optimize the uh, efficiency. The new equipment 
and uh, AI and automation and the combination with uh, information technology can lead to optim optim uh, maximize of the process. We have uh, AI technology which can do automation of certification and uh, uh, face recognition, automatic transmission together. And this is a good combination, and we can achieve passenger automatic certific uh, screening, and uh, and this can send automatic feedback, and this can have been implemented in Beijing Capital Airport for eight months, and. Uh, we have imp made improvement in a lot of aspects. First of all, this improved the quality and uh, efficiency by 60%. And we have uh, Im also improved uh, the performance. And uh, for three seconds, the passenger information can be verified. And also we improved the satisfaction of passengers, and uh, they have improved the experiences and also reduced uh, the labor. And uh, because this is uh, also with uh, TSA and uh, ECAC, where screeners face a lot of uh, workload, and we also reduced interference. And we're going to implement in the new Beijing Daxing Airport. Port. We have more automatic lanes, and uh, you are all welcome to uh, Beijing Daxing New Airport. We also believe that the implementation of AFSEC requirements can also improve the efficiency of airports and help airports to improve their service. And uh, satisfaction of passengers will also be improved. And uh, this is what is required uh, from the managers, because there is a fierce competition among hub airports. Firstly, new equipage and uh, process can maximize uh, the utility of uh, the airport, and uh, by doing so, the lanes will be reduced and uh, reduce uh, the physical occupation in space within the airport. This is also what is uh, required by the operators. The usage of equipage can also increase investment from the operators, and we also need to improve the space allocation, and it requires investment. But we believe this investment is worthwhile because service has been improved and the resources of terminals have been improved, and it's good to the general operation of the airport. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamming. That was very informative. Thank you very much. Um, we can briefly switch to the polling results for at least the first question. That would be extremely helpful. Okay. So the first question is around, should ICAO establish uh, minimum global detection standards for aviation screening? Uh, so far as you can see, it's predominantly in favor. Uh, high support from an agree and strongly agree, a few disagreements, but I think it uh, shows a general trend on, on the voting we've seen so far on, on the polling questions. So, so thank you for those who are, who are voting. Thank you very much for that. So moving on, uh, Mr. Kevin Schmidt, um, he is uh, the Vice President of Government Relations for Smith's Group, but he's also our new chair for the Security Manufacturers Coalition, so congratulations. Um, Smith's Group is a world leader in practical application of advanced technologies, deliver products for services for security, inspection, medical, energy, communications, and engineering components. So Kevin, from the industry standpoint, um, obviously there are a number of certifying authorities out, authorities out there, there are specific needs based on the customers that you're trying to uh, provide products, effective and uh, operationally suitable products. What would an ICAO Global Aviation Security Standard mean for industry? 
Thank you, Nick. Uh, the, the short answer to the question is it would have a significant uh, improvement for our companies in investing R&D R and D or resources to to enhance kind of threat detection and other capabilities that's needed. So the Security Manufacturers Coalition was established uh, in the U.S. about seven years ago under the Airport Consultants Council. Uh, the main reason for that was the our, com our our companies that are in this arena that were interested in harmonization. Uh, in, in communicating our interests to our customers, wanted to come together to really focus in on, on big ticket items that, that, that we can focus in on our R&D investments. So the companies that, that are represented under the SMC are RapidScan, uh, L3, Smith Detection, Analogic, uh, Lidos, Patel, VTC, and Garrett Metal Detectors. And one of the first priorities that we had was to provide not only certainty in the standards and requirements, but also certainty in the budget and the budgets, because that's really what drives our R&D investment. So if you look at one of our companies, they've invested over $450 million in R&D over the last 10 years. That's a significant investment by, by just one company. And the question is, how can you harness that investment to get what you need, and that all comes back to standardization of requirements, but also the budget. So one of the first priorities that we had was reaching out to TSA and also the US Congress and trying to get established a budget that would give us a five-year look into the intentions of our TSA customer. Uh, that had a s significant improvement uh, when, when it was released in allowing us to be able to focus in on check baggage, checkpoint, uh, and, and, and really make sure that we were leveraging everything that we needed to do to provide the capabilities uh, to, to our customers. Uh, Congress has since requested that five-year update to be done every year, uh, and that, that gives us projections into the out years. For example, computed tomography, uh, there's over $1.2 billion that's going to be invested by the United States. Uh, that's a significant investment that we are all going to want to compete on. Therefore, we're going to want to make sure that, that we're developing our algorithms at a, at a very rapid pace to give TSA everything that they need so that they can get to that gold standard of detection, which is CT. Uh, in a follow-up to uh, the five-year budget, we reached out to Congress and we also talked about third-party testing. Uh, that would allow us to be able to streamline our efforts without having to go through repetitive testing across the world. Uh, if we could get consensus and agreement that certain uh, national labs or certain uh, uh, regional authorities like ECAC uh, or TSA, if their standards could be accepted, uh, that would help accelerate our review of our equipment and get it into your hands uh, in, a, in, a, in a quicker way. Uh, so the third party testing uh, was something that we had pushed forward on with the U.S. Congress. Uh, pr the President of the United States just signed the FAA Reauthorization Act uh, in October of this year, uh, requesting TSA to come up with standards for 30, third party testing. In addition to that, uh, they also, uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, primarily uh, with the help of uh, Senator Thune, uh, the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, and uh, Chairman Katko, uh, congressman from, from New York, who, who will be here in the next couple of days. Uh, they were also traveling around the world and seeing the innovation that was taking place outside of the U.S. And so they, want, they wanted to accelerate that as much as possible in regards to the review of our equipment. And so they... They directed TSA to specifically work with ICAO uh, to come up with international standards, uh, reciprocal standards that, that, uh, that could be agreed upon. Uh, think of it almost as a, a minimum baseline and then every other detection standard uh, that you have above that. That would only what, uh, what would be tested to uh, uh, once, once you've achieved the baseline, re regardless of where you've achieved that. And in accordance with the TSA and their standards that they've established, whether it be through the National Institutes of Science and Technology, 
uh, or, or, or internal or also to address cybersecurity issues. So the short of, the short of it is, is the, the, the ability to streamline those standards will allow us to really focus in on those new and emerging threats uh, that pop up. The, you, know, you don't want to get into a situation where you have lags and, and powder uh, issues that you're constantly rushing to. So predictability on those standards is important, uh, but also if, if we have a minimum baseline that's been agreed to throughout the world, uh, the ability to quickly surge to those new threats and provide solutions will be enhanced because we will not have wasted uh, our R&D investments. Great. Thank you very much for Kevin. Uh, absolutely. I mean, industry are close partners uh, to all of our regulators, and we know that uh, we're successful if you're successful and so on and so forth. So I, I think that partnership is key. So um, moving on, uh, Matthew Vaughn is the Director of Aviation Security for the International Air Transport Association. Uh, he's based here in Montreal, Canada. Uh, previously, Matt served, uh, worked for Ethad Airways and the National Air Carrier of the United Arab Emirates for over eight years, of which he spent the last five years as the head of aviation security. Matt has over 18 years of security management experience drawing from law enforcement. So Matthew, you've heard a lot of comments today about ideas, concepts, and I'm going to kind of weave in here a question that came from the audience. Um, the question is around, is harmonization of certification standards achievable? Uh, considering all the challenges that were raised today, and I'll, I'll also seek the input of the other panelists as well, but obviously you can see there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, opportunities, but also some challenges that have to be overcome. Do you have any initial thoughts on, on, on those, th those thoughts? Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks for the throwaway, throwaway question. So, um, if I could pick up on what Sonia was talking about, it's, it's a universal threat, and the um, instances that we've faced over the last few years have arguably demonstrated that, that there is no one country that, that isn't subject to what we're talking about today. The, the realities are there that screening implementation, specifically around passenger screening, is different in other parts of the world. And even in countries, they're different between airports and locations. So, um, and when we talk about risk-based security, I don't actually think that's a problem. There are cultural differences. Passengers travel with different things. And in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, the challenges around cabin baggage uh, screening. And um, most specifically, you know, how do you get those messages out to the passengers you know, further up the stream so that you can best prepare them for what's going to take place at, at the checkpoint? Um, there's also an oxymoron, because if you give away the CONOPS, um, you've also got adversaries that can, that can game the system. And, and, and we already know, again, that, that they are looking to, to mimic and clone certain cultural norms in order to get through, to get through checkpoints that we see today. So I'm not sure if that's come directly to your question, but uh, over to the panel if anyone else has a different point. No, it's extremely helpful. I think to your point, there's so many uh, unique scenarios, and you've been to one airport, you've been to one airport. They all, they're all their own challenges and their own opportunities. So yeah, so if I can look at the panelists, if anybody has any thoughts, are, are, is it too aspirational? Is it something achievable? Do we think realistically with the right time and energy and subject matter experts, we could get to the point of an ICAO performance standard? Uh, I don't know, Sonia or Andy, if you have any thoughts? Oh, we might need the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, thanks, Nick. So I definitely think it is achievable. Um, not that there won't be difficulties along the way, and those difficulties I kind of bucket into four general areas. First, there's the pure technical issues around the detection standards itself, the test methodologies, how test execution is done, how would we um, approve a testing center to conduct a certification test of an IKO standard? All of those things kind of fall under that technical bucket. Then there's the legal issues um, that each um, member state would have to address um, regarding such, a, such an initiative. Funding is obviously an issue. Um, and how would we make sure that uh, this effort is, would, would be appropriately funded and sought through. And then there's process, and I touched on process under technical. They're, they're somewhat related, but, but and, and, and Sonia touched on this quite a bit, the sharing of the classified information. And when we are, when we are establishing a classified detection standard, if you will, 
how would we manage that? There's some, definitely some hurdles to be overcome there, but everyone has kind of touched on, I think, a, a, an overall baseline that um, I do think is definitely achievable, not that then each uh, member state may choose to go above and beyond that um, in their own realm, but having that global baseline standard, I think, can only overall increase the security effectiveness globally, and, and that is, I, would be a huge benefit to our industry, and I, I do think it's achievable, um, given we have the right people um, tackling the issue, and um, it'll take a little bit of time, but it, it's, it's achievable, definitely. Great. Thanks. I know, Sonia, you have one comment briefly. I know we're coming to a close here. Please. We, uh, yes, I just wanted to add to what was uh, said. We have to say to ourselves that if we have a comprehensive system, that this could take many, many years to implement. Is, are there things we can do today? Yes, there are. Could we start by uh, prohibiting articles, and then we can share on that through manuals? So there are short-term measures we can take to achieve success without waiting to have a comprehensive system in place. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So as you can see on your screen, you can see the latest update on the polling. Um, once again, it looks very favorable for agree and strongly agree in pursuing uh, this concept. Uh, so if I could just summarize some of the thoughts and concepts that I've heard today, I think there is a genuine interest to explore this concept further. Um, I think this concept will require a dedicated focus of a specific subject matter experts uh, with allocated resources um, and ensuring and maintaining the information accordingly. Uh, the goals need to be upstated or stated up front and clearly well defined um, and where opportunities are to leverage best practices that are being done by various certifying authorities around the world. I think we should look at those opportunities. So if you will all please and thank you, please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful conversation today. Thank you very much for your input. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And a warm hand of applause for our moderator today, Dominique. Thank you so much for a job well done. Excellent. Excellent. We're running short on time. As you can see, we had to begin just a bit late, but we'll go right into our first Sky Talk presentation. And for that, we're happy to welcome to the lectern Mr. Jimmy Pang. He is the president of the Supply Chain Safety and Security Association. Mr. Pang, please. See that. Okay. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay. Uh, I will try my very best before the coffee break. Okay. Uh, the coffee going to be running cold. Yeah, I will not keep it cold. Okay, I will keep it hot for you. Um, okay. Uh, today I'm very honored to representing uh, Surprising City and Security Association from Hong Kong. Okay, my topic is about cross-border re-export aviation threat. How the industry approach to tackle the situation. Okay, um, this is me. Okay, uh, 30 years time, uh, witnesses and participating in this uh, supply chain area from manufacturing to uh, logistic industry and then consulting. Uh, our association establishing in 2002 a group of um, uh, experts from uh, information security and logistic security. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have to tackle the situation of the, a lot of um, new initiative from the supply chain security after the 911. Okay, uh, because of that reason, we also act as a role as an NGO uh, between the government and policy maker and make the industry understand what is the world going on. Uh, that's why we're participating and actively, actively in um, international conferences such as ICAO, uh, WCO, Interpol, etc. Okay, 
uh, today's agenda uh, about the challenging what we are facing, particularly uh, in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in uh, in Asia, and we did something, uh, and also we find something very interesting. A special bonus of today, I learned a story, a skill from our member. The skill is not opening the box, but they can tell what inside the box, even the counterfeit batteries. Amazing, right? Okay, allow me to share with you the story. Okay, um, our situation. Okay, we are the well um, uh, uh, leading airport. Okay, we have a three million ton uh, air cargo export annually. Okay, and also um, our air cargos, uh, we have um, we have uh, uh, around seventy percent is come from another jurisdiction area. Okay, and we have um, a very high consolidation yield, uh, multi-level consolidation consolidator to make that happen. Okay. Um, and also one thing is very special. If you come to Hong Kong you will find uh, our cargo consolidation is done in time. Okay. You may able to see them, touch them in in the industrial area. Okay. Uh, we have a we have uh, over 100 airlines operating with the cargoes and 1,500 cargo agents and 100,000 shippers. The challenging is, okay, uh, a lot of shippers, like I mentioned, uh, the goods come, come from another jurisdiction, truck into Hong Kong, and then we export by air to the world. That's what we call a cross-border we export goods. And within a very short time frame, less than 24 hours, and to at least more than one jurisdiction system. Okay. Um, last, uh, in 2016, uh, when Akil announced the policy of phasing out the account consigner, this is a challenging to the situation in Hong Kong. And how can the, how can the Hong Kong to uh, the industry to enhancing the aviation security standard and maintaining the business? That's why 18 months ago, before the people didn't, they really get in to understand the, the impact of this phasing out account consigner policy, we conduct a survey with around 100 uh, members from the cargo agents. The result? is around 70% of the company, they have a plan, sort of plan to enhancing the security based on different standards, like TAPA and AEO. Another 16% of the company, they, have, they don't have a sort of plan, but they, they're ready to do something, okay? And also, we, we asked them, what is the major concern to them to, uh, regarding to the supply and security? They told us, mainly, of course, it's commercial um, interests about uh, deception and also uh, bad debt. This is very high, high concern to them. But we specify to the supply and security issues. They told us all about the hidden dangerous goods as well as anti-terrorism attacks and the smuggling issues. Okay, first of all, based on, based on what they told us about their interest to enhancing the supply and security, um, in Hong Kong, we have the RA program, the Aviation Security Program, which is based on the Annex 17, and, our, and then we have the local uh, Aviation Security Program. And for the TAPA is, um, uh, may not be everyone well, well known here. Uh, allow me to explain a little bit. TAPA is uh, formed around uh, 20 years ago by the high values, uh, 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 high tech companies uh, like Intel, HP, Hitachi. Okay, because the high value of the cargo is the target of the commercial crime, like robbery and uh, uh, hijacking. That's why they have, the, they have their own standard. It's called FSL, Fixed Security Requirements. 
And the other one is the AEO mentioned in the survey, and uh, which is initiated by the WCO, the safe standard, okay, the safe uh, framework, which is um, uh, around 10 years ago. And these three standards have something in common. It's all um, a volunteer basis uh, program initiative. And, but for the RAR, that means the, uh, uh, it's, um, it's uh, more focusing on the aviation export. And for the AEO, it's more for the custom, okay, concerning to the smuggling and anti-terrorism. For the TAPA, it's totally commercial initiative. And because of these three standards they raise, okay, and uh, we try to see any common area which is helping the industry to enhancing their security and also align with the aviation security matters. Um, we, find, we find basically the structure and the style is quite different. That's why we, we form a group of experts. Um, I have to appreciate our, our colleagues here, here uh, Mr. Green, uh, uh, ACCV validator, and also Mr. Tai, uh, with over 10 years uh, experience in international uh, supply chain security, particularly. He also the board of member of uh, from the TAPA. And also Mrs. Chang, uh, he is a, a well-known consultant in Hong Kong for 20 years experience in aviation security. And then we sit down together and we're analyzing all this uh, complicated structure and style. And then finally we have a conclusion is a six dimension. Uh, people security, convenience security, management security, and facility security, as well as operation security and information security. Based on this structure, we we analyzing, uh, 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 we try to structure uh, and benchmarking all these three standards, and they have the situation like this, okay. And also we find the complexity of the requirement, you can see uh, relatively uh, the, the regulator agents program is simpler than the TAPA as well as the AEO. And we look inside also commonly with that six requirement. And when we're looking at these six requirements to the, to the daily operation to the cargo agents, Actually, what their concern to those supply chain security related risks, which is also have quite uh, effective uh, uh, to those threats. And that's why we want to uh, promoting one side they can compile with different standards. On the other hand, they can also enhance the business result. That's our aim. Okay, and the second part of our survey is about uh, industry concern. Like I mentioned before, the industry, they really concerning about the hidden dangerous goods, particularly lithium battery. And the challenging to them is, how, how could they know if the cargo passed through Hong Kong with very short time frame? And they have to find out, is there any misdecorations right there? And we all know the dangerous goods is under the Annex 18 is a um, uh, 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 very high concern uh, issues or to the world. And now the dangerous goods, some people will say, is become a, not just a safety matters, it's also become a security matters. So people asking us, should I be the superhero having X-ray eye to see through the cargoes? Yeah. Actually, the answer is, do it right the first time, rather than check it at the last moment. So I learned from our members, he, they, they show us some interesting approach, is the concept is everything is not equal. Shipper, consignee, shipment, routing, packaging, etc. It all tells you what it was about the, the shipment. What kind of risk is right there? So this also shows us some approach, like I mentioned before, without opening the box. They can tell us these shipments with counterfeit or problematic battery inside 
inside the shipment. Quite amazing, huh? How do they do that? Actually, they start from a new client. When, they, when they're having a new client, uh, they will send a, a, a train the salesman to having a client evaluation. Uh, this is what we said. But actually, they say it's client's caring program to visiting the client, to know who are they and uh, what kind of uh, 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 shipment that they that they that they doing. And just like the hotel and airlines loyalty program, each client they have a portfolio. And based on the portfolio, they already understand the risk profile. At the same time, if the performance of the first few shipment is good, then they were giving them some candies, like free handling shipments or some terms and conditions even better, okay? Um, at the same time, if the shipment performance is not very nice, the first few shipments, they do the open box or they do the very, very tedious um, uh, uh, checking. If some declaration is not that accurate or the people, they have launch issues with the, with the shipment declarations, then they will put them in the special area and conducting some um, checking. This is the who issues. At the same time, when the shipments, uh, when the shipments not arrived yet, they will also ask the client, if possible, allow me to go to the factory take a look, which likely is cross border beyond the beyond the um, jurisdiction. But the commercial side, they can do it. So uh, the salesman or the people they will go to the factory if they can. Otherwise, they will ask them some pictures of the assembly line. When they look at the pictures of the assembly line of the products, particularly battery, if expert knows, or the trained people will know, the lithium battery never packed in this way. So in the factory level, people start to already know this is not a qualified battery or some problematic issues may be there. So, so the salesman will talk to the boss. Maybe sometimes the boss doesn't know the matters, the problem, because of the very complex supply chain of the battery, and also procurement and assembly process right there. So that's why they were having a conversation to try to help the company to identify is it appropriate or not, before we really pack and go and ship it to Hong Kong, while Hong Kong to the world. OK. This is a little bit. Um, uh, 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 good stories uh, we learn from our members. This is the way how they tackle the commercial crime. I mean, sorry, the com commercial threat and also the um, uh, the criminal threat and smuggling as well as anti terrorism matters. Get back to the one. Okay. Um, we hope this approach and also adding some favor and the concern from the industry, we enable the compliance matters as well as creating risk-free business to helping them to do better business. That is the whole approach that we are doing. So we tell the industry to see through the cargo or buy from your eyes is your own choice. Okay, some of our member uh, they implement the program very successfully, and then they come to us. They say, "Can we having a more structural approach?" And then, and then we spend like two years time to try to try to structure the whole approach and the, all the best practice together to form a program. It's called Lead Cat. Um, it's um, lithium battery certification for air transport. From our from, from, from the name, it's more like to the lithium battery. But the truth is, when the people, they caring about the lithium battery, they also look at who is the shipper, who is the consignee. At the same time, they will also understand what kind of product is right there. And also, what kind of routing and how to, how to, how to do the whole process. That means, besides about lithium battery, smuggling, as well as security um, uh, and safety matter also being taken care. So in conclusion, I would say um, 
when we do when we implementing a policy, it's not easy. Um, but business interest is one of the best driver always because policymakers always need the industry together, hand in hand, to implement it to make it better. Collaboration and communicating with the industry and also other standards is one of the good uh, uh, approach to them. And industry concern, always a priority to the industry. May not be totally aligned with the policy sometimes, but if we look deep inside, a lot of comments right there, which help us to having a better business today. And that's why I would suggest to let's share uh, our best practice and your best practices uh, to enhancing the safety and security. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, two minutes more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Pang. I'd like to emphasize a few words that you said at the end about communication and cooperation, collaboration. Those are the themes that we need to pursue, of course, as we meet these challenges. Yes, we are going for coffee. We'll have a 20-minute or so coffee break because we're not that far away from lunch, so we should be able to manage both of them together. So I'd like to see you back at 11.25 as we resume with session two. And I'd like to mention as well that Coffee Break is sponsored by Synapse Technology Corporation. Enjoy the coffee break. See you back in about 20 minutes. Thank you so much.